Then the third thing that the clause does is then to instruct a broad transformation mandate premised on three things, right? So we now know we've got an anti-property clause. We also know that the state is entitled constitutionally to take private property for the benefit of the broader public. And then what the clause does is then to insert these three primary instruments for land reform. One is security of tenure. And again, there is a larger historical story why black people do not have secure tenure on the land. The second is redistribution. And redistribution is simply based on land need or land hunger, you know, because it requires access to land on an equitable basis. So if you don't have access to land on an equitable basis, the Constitution expressly mandates the state to ensure that that happens. And then the third is what is called restitution. And restitution is confined to those people who can prove claims from the 19th of June, 1913. If you can prove that you were dispossessed after the 19th of June, 1913, which is the date when the Native Land Act came into operation. Again, I talk a lot about the Native Land Act in my book and what it meant and how it disrupted uh, black people's lives. But to redress that problem, there was a specific constitutional mandate granted by Section 25. So the larger part of this part of my presentation is to illustrate that not only do we have an anti-property clause, we have a constitutional mandate, an instruction given to the state to do land reform in a constitutionally compatible fashion. But our own experience, I spent four months as an acting judge in the Land Claims Court, and I've spent probably five or six years as an advocate working in part in land reform. My own experience is that land reform has been a collapse. It has been a failure. That is my own judgment. It has been an unmitigated disaster. On the side of restitution, no one knows the true figures, but they range between 4% and 7%. If you measure that against the target of the government in the Ready to Govern document that they published in 1992, that they intended to restitute 30% in the first five years of government, you can see that land reform has been a complete failure. My second observation is that land reform has been bedeviled by corruption. I have my own observations in watching how the land reform program unfolds. And I have many stories that I can share with the audience, those who want to know, that show that the process itself is bedeviled by corruption from within. So the landowners are corrupt, they are greedy, constantly demanding prices way above market value. The land claimants are equally corrupt, and the government bureaucrats are also corrupt. So no one is actually outside the net of corruption, right? So you are, and this, I can illustrate this with two examples. First of all, all of you know about the story of Malamala, right? It's a notorious story, and I was involved in the case for an amicus curiae. The Malamala game reserve is up for a land claim. The claim is found to be valid. The debate is about compensation. The valuers of the state ra range between 300 million to 700 million. Ultimately, the government pays a billion rands, almost 300 million rands in excess of the highest valu valuation. And you must ask yourself what happens then to the 300 million? Where does it actually go? Right? Another case where came before me as an acting judge in the Land Claims Court. Section 42D, those of you who practice in land law will know Section 42D, those are administrative settlements when a claim is not contested and the minister endorses it for payment. The underlying valuation are 40 million rands, but the offer made by the state is 89 million rands. So the question is, who's going to get the other 49 million rands, right? So, so you can multiply those stories over and over again, and you see that one of the major problems with land reform has been corruption. The third problem, of course, has been our fixation with the market-determined standard. I am now convinced that it is impossible to embark upon 
an effective land reform program if you fixate upon a market-driven standard. It is clear that the market will simply never deliver land reform at all. So you have to temper with the market-related standard. Whether one, as currently proposed, does it on a without compensation basis at all, or whether one insists on an just and equitable standard as a lower of the two. I will illustrate. I was sitting here about three weeks ago. The Minister of uh, Land Affairs, Maite Nguana Mashaba, and I was sitting this side. I asked her, how much has your government paid for land reform? In other words, on restitution claims. She told me the amount is 54 billion rands. I asked her, where has the money gone? Who has been the beneficiaries of land reform? She said the majority of the money has gone to owners of, of farms. So I said, but don't you think that it is scandalous for your government that it has paid white landowners, probably north of 30 billion rands, in circumstances where we all know as a matter of justice they got the land without compensation, and they got the land through imposition by the state, in addition, the entire system was functioning on the basis of state subsidies. Isn't this scandalous? And then she said, no, 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 you're being disrespectful. <laughs> <laughs> but you can ask yourself, was I being disrespectful or was I asking the right questions? Then, the fourth problem, it's again my own anecdotal observation, has been a total collapse of institutions. Right? If land reform is to be central to transformation, land reform cannot be relegated to some kind of a status of an ugly stepsister of the economy. Right? We tend to talk about the economy this side, education that side, and land reform somewhere. But the point of the matter is that if land reform is important for the country, it needs to be placed at the center of economic development, right? The way in which the government is structured does not place land reform at the heart of South Africa's economy. It becomes what I call the ugly stepsister of the economy. The institutions of land reform themselves function outside the economic cluster, right? The Department of Land Affairs has no clear relationship with the Department of Treasury. The consequence is that the institutions that are meant to drive land reform are weak, corrupt, and have collapsed.